Hey everybody, Craig from the University of Applied Research and Development, and today we have with us Julie Bolson, who is the Director of Business Assurance at Spectrum Health. Hi Julie. Hi Craig, how are you? Amazing for having you with us. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. I'd love for you to share with us, Julie, you know, what you do at Spectrum Health, and I know that the, the, the name of your role and your responsibilities has changed to more reflect what you really do, so tell us about that. Yeah, so our department used to be uh, known as just the Department of Emergency Preparedness. Um, we really focused on obviously healthcare. Spectrum Health is a healthcare organization. And so it was really the emergency management meeting the accreditation uh, requirements through Joint Commission, uh, CMS, the um, Center for Medicaid Medicare Services in the United States, and really trying to set the standard for what we thought was best practice within our organization and trying to keep our organization safe during a crisis. Um, as we began to build the department um, and our system kept building, we realized that emergency preparedness was really just one focus of our department and it included also business continuity, a lot of education to the organization, um, and really um, how do we how do we prepare but then how do we manage our business through a crisis and so really looking at um, a broader name to the department and so we modified it a little bit to business assurance it we work very tightly with our is department on incident management within that structure um, in fact have developed an incident command structure specific to is so if we have any data issues, if we have any technology issues, they stand up that incident command structure within IS. We work very closely side by side with them. Um, and their department was known as service assurance. And so it really kind of made sense that as we're looking forward into our future and looking at the strategy of our department, um, managing the business and ensuring that we can maintain operations throughout a crisis, um, business assurance just kind of came naturally to us. Yeah, that, that sounds like it makes sense. You mentioned that your incident command system, you tailored it for your environment. So tell us about that, because often people understand the FEMA um, incident command system, and there's different versions of it, obviously, in different parts of the world. But tell us how you customized it in your context. Yeah, and so um, we actually took the incident command structure within I, um, our information services department to stand up for major incidents if technology goes down. So they run an incident within IS. Uh, we sit as actually, the incident commander for the system sits as a liaison officer within that IS structure. And should we determine as the incident commander that it's broader than just information services that we really need to engage the whole organization, we flip that structure into our normal incident command structure. Then IS becomes that liaison officer, and then we as incident commanders manage that incident for the entire organization. So that's one modification of that, right? Um, during COVID, we actually modified it a little bit further, and I don't know if you want me to get into that right now. Please or do. If you want. Okay. Yeah. So, so um, you, despite the fact that our organization is a very a pretty strong incident command driven organization i mean we've been using incident command for years right like everybody else um we've done a lot of education we stand up incident command pretty often within our organization based on um different incidents that are occurring so even a day-to-day -day surge um, historically we've set up incident command trying to manage that communication out to the organization broadly We've got 14 hospitals, so it takes a little bit to, you know, coordinate all of that communication across all of our system. But during the COVID incident, um, early on, we recognized that this was obviously much larger than any of the other incidents that we managed. And we needed to be, we needed to involve more staff within, more team members within our organization that are normally educated for incident command. And so we, we used the traditional incident command structure, but as we expanded it out, we used what we called integrated work groups and camps. 
And so we, we were able to pull together more leaders within the organization for specific roles. Um, for example, we had what was called the PPE Integrated Work Group. That group came out of quality, safety, <clears throat> and patient experience and focused solely on PPE. So that integrated work group actually rolled up through our operations section. So we kept that main mainframe structure of the incident command, but built it out, made sense to everyone within our organization using terminology that was familiar to them um, and within the roles that they that they held on a day-to-day -day basis. So there's several examples of that um, integrated work groups and different camps that we had implemented during COVID to make things run a little bit more smoothly and then give this, the tasks to the owners that were the content experts. Hmm. When you say camps, what do you mean? So those were just a little bit bigger and those were um, the, the, um, ongoing groups, the integrated work groups were more like a task force. So the camp would be almost equivalent to a committee that would stay within the structure, right? So it was, um, they were permanent fixtures within the command center structure during COVID. And then the integrated work groups, we would set up as we needed them specific to a topic. So Julie, why don't you tell us your story? How did you get into doing what you're doing and why? Wow, yeah. So I am a nurse by profession. I um, grew up in the healthcare system at one of our local hospitals, um, went through um, a staff nursing position into a nursing leadership position, um, a hospital supervisor sort of, and then managed um, several different units or departments. And throughout this whole thing, I was active in what we called our disaster committee. And this was, I've been in healthcare quite a while. Um, in fact, just had my 40 year anniversary. So um, several oh, years ago, <laughs> thank you. Several years ago, um, I became involved in the disaster committee, what we called it back then. And it was really looking at how do we prepare for, at that point, um, mass casualty incidents, right? MCIs was really the focus back then. Um, and then as it became more complex, after 9-11, we received you know, a significant amount of grant funding from the federal government. Um, Joint Commission and CMS and all of those accrediting bodies were increasing the number of standards and regulations that we needed to be compliant with to maintain our accreditation. Um, I, I approached the executive team um, to allow me to actually develop the department of at that point it was emergency preparedness to focus on how are we going to um, effectively spend the grant funding funding and be in compliance with all of the grant funding regulations that we needed you know to meet as well as ensuring that we were going to be compliant with joint commission and all of the other accrediting standards that was back in 2000 um, i started with myself and one other person and i think that it's unique that um, as a nurse, I head up this department. A lot of times the emergency preparedness department will live in facilities or security. But I think having my background in nursing, I bring to the table a different conversation about right. not just being right, not just being prepared from a security incident perspective, but also, um, you know, patient surges. So how does that yes. affect the organization and how does that affect patient care? Um, and so then at that point, um, our system started growing. And as we continued to grow, we continued to add more team members into the department. And it became my full-time job as opposed to a part-time job. <laughs> wow. How amazing that you bring that, um, that understanding and experience mm -hmm. from that transition, you know, through 9-11 and why you had to do what you do with the structuring and writing things up. But bringing that experience... So you would have seen technology change over this period of time. Obviously, people have jumped onto video conferencing because it's the only way to communicate. So what else have you seen has been an impact or a change in technology in your role? Yeah, so, you know, we, um, I remember having emergency phones, right, that were, that were landline phones 
on every department within every hospital that we have within our system. And those were always the phones that we had to go to if for whatever reason, the rest of the phones, you know, were, were down, we couldn't get through to any place. They would always be a phone line. It was a redundant system. We've recently removed all of that because all of our phones are IP phones, right? They're now network connected. And right. so we manage that redundancy through our network connections by having a whole separate um, server farm, right? So we've got redundancies in all of our servers. And so if one section's not working, we can move it over to another section. And so we don't need to have all of those landline phones or those POTS lines, the plain old telephone system that we used to call them. Um, so we removed all of those and actually saved the organization a significant amount of um, dollars associated mm-hmm. with that process. Through COVID, um, Technology has been extremely significant um, and really supported us through our through our incident management. Um, here in the United States, we obviously started out as a command center in person in a room um, right. where we had probably had way too many people in a room as we, you know, retrospectively looking back at things now. And once cases started increasing in the United States, we decided we really needed to spread out just a little bit. So initially we found a bigger room, but we've got hospitals that go that cover the entire west side of the state of Michigan. And so how do we connect them into a system command center so that everybody is functioning consistently, but not have everybody in the same room, right? So they can connect in any time that they want. And so we... took a lesson and we set up a virtual command center that was open all the time virtually. And then as we manned our in-person command center structure, we could have that screen available and anytime anybody had a question or a concern or you know something they needed to have a conversation with incident command about, they could just log into that ongoing meeting on our virtual platform and be able to have that conversation with incident command in person, um, albeit virtually. So it was, if we did not have technology and the capacity to be able to have virtual meetings and set up those um, ongoing virtual meetings, it would have been a struggle for sure. It's really interesting that your phone system, you can now manage manage their redundancies and switch to another another server if the if one set of services goes down so your phone and your communications keeps working and you've also continued to operate the in-person command center but allow people to jump into that is that 24 7 that it's been available at different times yeah so we um we actually uh last may may of 2020 Um, As cases were increasing through the United States, we decided that all of us were going to go virtually from a command center perspective. We were all sitting in the same room with masks on, and it really didn't make any sense to us at all. So um, May of 2020, we did go virtually, and we ran it 24-7 and just, just closed our command center June 30th. Wow. You mean a few days ago? A few days ago. Wow. So your physical command center no longer is operating. It's all virtual. Yes. Okay. Is it it 24-7 still? So, no. So we went totally virtually from a command center perspective in June of 2020, May of 2020. And we were running 24-7 virtually in May of 2020. Um, all of us have been working from home. We've um, designed the command center structure in such a way that it functions virtually, um, which was a struggle for me originally because I always felt more comfortable with having everybody in the same room having the conversation. But certainly through the pandemic, we couldn't do that. It wasn't safe for any of us to be together. We needed to be able to maintain those personnel. And so we did go virtually. We um, we kept our command center open 24 seven, limited capacity at, at night versus during the day, but it was open 24 um, seven. And we always have an incident commander on call for our system 24 seven. So that position is always there. 
And then just this past June 30th, we closed it down completely. Wow. So IP phones over mm -hmm. a period of time, the virtual command center, are there any other technologies or systems that you've put in place to communicate with people and organize resources that weren't there prior to the pandemic? Um, so I think um, we use we use mass notification systems um, significantly, uh, and and we have for quite some time. I think the difference now is that we are moving away from a pager system right. into more of the text messaging technology and an email technology. Our organization has also had wireless phones for clinical care. Um, and we've transitioned to a different vendor for that service, which allows us now to broadly send messages to, to um, all of those phones if we need to, or to a specific group of people. Mm. So, so for example, if, if we changed a PPE process during the middle of COVID, because for whatever reason, we didn't have we didn't have the N95s that we had before, or we didn't have the masks that we had before. Um, and we put into place a process that we needed to communicate immediately. We could then use that wireless, that clinical wireless phone and connect with all of the charge nurses throughout all 14 of our hospitals on every floor to say, this process has changed. You need to go here and review it so you can ensure that you can, you know, share this information with the rest of your teams that are working today. So being able to use multiple different communication devices has really been helpful mm. throughout the pandemic. I saw a lot of um, marketing coming my way and a lot of emergency managers we spoke with over the last 12 months, getting a lot of information about disk notification systems and notifications being broadcast onto computer screens in an organization at any time of the day. Do you use that type of thing, those disk notification systems? So we, um, we don't, we don't use the notification systems that broadcast that bring up a message on our hmm. computer screens. We've developed, we have an intranet for our organization and we've developed right. our own type of nomenclature that we use. Um, hmm on that I actually put a banner across the top of it when we implement an, um, an emergency plan or incident command is open. And then team members can click on that and go to either a blog posting that describes that, you know, the incident in more depth or will refer them to various resources that they can use throughout that incident. With COVID being such a large incident and such a lengthy incident, Obviously, we needed to manage documents and, um, you know, make sure that we had version control in place for those right. documents so that people were following the right process. And so we developed a whole separate COVID-19 information center that lived within our intranet so that our team members could go there anytime they wanted and had probably about 20 different topics on there that they could click on a button at any at time of the day and then it, that brought up any of the documentation that was related to that topic um, ensuring that they had the most recent information visitor and access is a great example right as the pandemic evolved our visiting our visitor regulations or these changed initially allowing family members to come in as it became uh, more prevalent within the country and then within the state that the visitation minimized dramatically. Right. And then how do we manage visitation, right? How to virtually, how do we manage visitation? Right. So all of those documents were held within that intranet for all of our team members. Julie, can I just check? Cause the connection dropped out there for just a few <laughs> seconds. Um, so the, the banner alerts, if I'm, if I'm on the ward, and I'm using 
Microsoft Word or something else, does the banner alert come across the screen that I'm working on or do I have to go into the intranet and have the intranet open to see that banner alert? Yeah, you would have to go into, into that intranet at that point because it links to all of the documents that we have on our servers. Right. Um, we do also, though, I mean, the, the impetus to go to that page is that message that we send across those wireless phones that the staff nurses carry. And then we certainly overhead gotcha. page like we do. Okay. So they do get some sort of personal notification to yep. go and check out the update or the yep. new version. Yep. Gotcha. Interesting. Okay. Julie, if someone wanted to do what you do, and um, head in their career to hold the type of position that you do, what would you encourage people to do in terms of skills and understandings and experiences to do your job well? Well, I think you have to have, you know, at least um, some understanding of healthcare, right? And what is important? What is the foundation of um, the healthcare organizations wherever you're going to live? Um, definitely, you need to have some experience or some education or background in emergency preparedness. Um, and I think, you know, <clears throat> in the States, the, the private sector of the healthcare system is definitely different than the public sector of the county emergency managers or the state emergency managers. We do all function with that incident command structure. So um, intimate knowledge of incident command structure intimate knowledge of the um, framework for emergency preparedness, the, you know, the prevention and the mitigation and um, really looking at how, how do you build out program? How do you use that um, infrastructure, that framework to be able to build out a program and then work within the healthcare organization? Um, there's definitely programs out there where you can get an, um, a, a bachelor's degree or master's degree in emergency management. Obviously, if you're if you wanted to go into a world such as this, that would be one area. Um, <clears throat> masters in health administration, masters in public administration certainly would be good foundations as well. I am a little bit biased because I'm a nurse. And so I think that obviously having that Clinical background is is very important for managing mm -hmm. emergency preparedness and healthcare, um, but certainly that's um, an area that can be um, absorbed through um, um, the the connections with your with your leaders and the rest of your team members in those clinical spaces, right? I mean, you mm -hmm. can you can you can put people in charge of committees or certainly um, connect together with a partner and a colleague that lives in the clinical space to be able to understand really the impact of emergency preparedness in that space. Right. So understanding the industry, um, training in emergency management, and also working within the organization, connecting with people to understand who are the right people to, to connect with in that emergency or preparing for it anyway. That's really good. That's really good. I think that um, there are some industries where maybe you don't need such a deep understanding of coming from the industry yourself, because maybe the technical knowledge or the, like you say, clinical knowledge is um, it's not so important. But in healthcare, I can see that it would be so important yeah. to have that. Yeah, that's good. Well, look, Julie, really want to thank you for your time. I know you're really busy and thank you for thank you for your service and what you've done to help um, your organization navigate through such a really challenging time that we're not totally out of yet. But thank you very much for the work that you're doing and and giving us your wisdom and experiences as well. If people want to connect with you, Julie, what's the best way to do that? The best way to connect with me probably is just through my email and it's julie.bolson at spectrumhealth.org. Awesome. Thank you for that, Julie. You have a great day. Thanks. You too.